What you are seeing in front of you is a map of man-made satellites in their orbits around Earth. And these are just the functioning satellites. It does not include satellites that are no longer working, but still in orbit, nor the immense amount of space junk ranging from discarded rocket stages left in orbit after usage, to the debris that's orbiting around Earth due to satellite collisions and the occasional test of an anti-satellite weapon. We humans, we've managed to pollute our atmosphere with light, and we have polluted the skies overhead with satellites. A dilemma that poses increasing problems for astronomers and astrophotographers alike. Since the launch of the first satellite, Sputnik 1, on October 4th, 1957, some 6,740 successful launches of satellites have been conducted. And according to the European Space Agency, these have placed 19,560 satellites into orbit. Since those original orbits, 6,360 satellites have failed and deorbited. Of that remaining 13,230 satellites still in orbit, 3,030 have ceased to function but remain in orbit. There are presently so many satellites up there that there have been some collisions too, and a collision between two objects moving, if in low Earth orbit at nearly 8 kilometers per second, can shatter them into thousands of tiny pieces, some no bigger than a grain of sand. And a projectile the size of a grain of sand moving at almost 8 kilometers per second contains far more energy than a bullet. In 2016, a piece of satellite debris, a fleck of paint or a piece of metal no more than a few thousandths of a millimeter across, impacted one of the windows of the International Space Station. As you can see, even that minuscule piece was enough to do significant damage. For the purposes of space travel and exploration, these satellites create hazards, but from the ground, for we astrophotographers and astronomers, these satellites and their debris represent an ever-growing obstacle, interrupting Earth-based astrophotography and astronomy. Now, we not only have to deal with light pollution, we have to deal with satellite pollution. The image that you're seeing right now I shot at the Sky Story Observatory, and it represents a single 60-second subframe shot of the Ghost Nebula. I will end up having to call 3-5% to of the subs following a typical night worth of shooting. And some persons have reported to me that they end up calling as much as 30% of their subs due to satellite pollution. Fundamentally, the closer one is to the equator, the more likely they are going to encounter satellite pollution. This is a 3D projection of satellite orbits taken from Satellite Explorer. Far off from Earth, you can see satellites high in deep orbit. By and large, they don't represent much of a problem for us because they're barely visible and there aren't many of them. But we do see a lot of satellites at middle-high Earth orbit. And there is a tight belt of satellites at a roughly equatorial orbit. And they are much more likely to present astrophotography problems than the far-off satellites in deep orbit. But many of these satellites do have an equatorial orbit. And while you cannot entirely prevent them from showing up in a sub, you can increase the chances of avoiding having them turn up in frames by trying to shoot targets to the north or south of the equator. I know, who wants to have to rule out the entire equatorial region? There are a lot of interesting targets that fall in that region from time to time, but that's the world that we have. And yet, that is not even the worst problem. Let's zoom in and take a closer look. This is indeed disturbing. The entire globe, from Arctic Circle to Antarctic Circle, is covered in a tight weave of satellites. Thousands and thousands of them. Some of these belong to the new Starlink system, which, I have to admit, I appreciate because it was only when Starlink came out that, living in my somewhat remote location in the backwoods of Canada, that I was ever able to get a decent internet connection. Up until very recently, we were making do with phone lines operating at the old 56 kilobaud level. But as you can see from the 3D projection here, it's only when you get at very high latitudes, above about the 50th parallel, that some of the satellite mess starts to clear up. There's still plenty of satellite pollution, but it's a lot less dense than the net-like weave that we have below the 50th parallel. So if you happen to live at one of those more northern latitudes, such as northern Europe, say from Denmark on, or if you're in Canada, like I am, as far north as Labrador on up, or at the very tip of South America, you can get a little relief from the immense amount of satellite pollution that exists these days. And if you live about as far as the Arctic Circle, you can get more relief. But that also means the vast majority of people live well within the net of satellite pollution. And as you can see, most of that satellite pollution is in low Earth orbit. So these are satellites that will move very fast, tracking across your entire shot, and because they're closer to Earth, they will also be brighter. 
So what can be done? By and large, unless you're willing to make a radical relocation, there isn't much you can do to avoid satellites. Essentially, the further north or south of the equator you are, the less satellite density you'll have overhead. But nonetheless, there's no avoiding the satellites. Not unless you're willing to go at least as far north as the southern border of Denmark, or as far south as the southern tips of Chile and Argentina and South America. And even then, that only helps. To really get clear of most satellites, you'd have to move north of the Arctic Circle or south of the Antarctic Circle. So, in a practical sense, all we can do is try to adapt. It may help to try to shoot targets to the north if you're in the northern hemisphere or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. But I think that would only work if you're already pretty far south or pretty far north. And besides, who wants to do that all the time? It means you'd miss some great imaging opportunities. Some clever persons have been coming out with software which also helps with satellites. Frank, who brings us the SETI Astro Suite, has introduced a satellite trail remover into cosmic clarity. And I've heard good reports about it. For myself, I haven't really gotten to test it and I'm not going to get a chance to test it. And I can tell you why. I have had a long policy of discarding subs with satellite trails in them. Not all subs, but the subs that have satellites that track directly across my subjects of interest I will discard. So, for example, lately I've been shooting Barnard 33, the Horsehead Nebula. If I happen to have a satellite track around the outskirts of the image, that's fine. I can keep that, and if it's not faded out adequately with the stacking software, I can remove it later on digitally with a tool like InPainting. But it must also be accepted that digital removal of an artifact such as a satellite trail is absolutely going to change the data. No matter how good the removal tool is, it cannot tell what was supposed to be underneath that information. So it's possible, in the removing of a satellite trail, that you'll also remove something interesting. Most likely, you might just displace a star or two. But who knows, within that area that was removed, there could be anything from hints of a faint galaxy to an undiscovered comet. But, in general, if my goal is to shoot a specific region within an image, like if my goal is to shoot specifically the Horsehead Nebula, and I know there's going to be a lot of surrounding image, I will accept satellite trails in the subs as long as they are not too bright and they do not cross over the main subject of interest. If I am shooting an image that is intended to be as accurate as possible throughout the entire image, or where the subject of interest is the entire image, like the Tadpole Nebula that I recently shot, then I will not accept any subs whatsoever that have satellite trails in them, no matter how faint. Some persons have said it's okay to accept satellite trails because the stacking software will average them out. That's not really the right way to look at it. The stacking software will not average out satellite trails, it will average them in. By which I mean, if there are lots and lots of good subs, then the satellite trail may become lost among the good information. But that's iffy. This is an image I shot of the globular star cluster NGC 7078 just last night beneath the full moon. The image is the product of 193 60 second subs, of which 9 had satellite trails. I shot it in LRGB and stacked all the subs this morning. The only processing that's been done is I ran the blur exterminator on the masters, stretched and denoised the histograms, and combined the LRGB. Several trails, the very faintest trails, were averaged in to the point they were lost among the good information. Nonetheless, you can see four satellite trails that remain in the image. They were averaged in. But here is the same image, stacked again, after I went through all the subs and manually removed every image with a satellite trail in it. The only way to reliably get satellite trails out of an image is to manually inspect the images for the trails. And while some software can help identify and even remove these trails, to be absolutely sure of removing satellite pollution, you have to get them out manually. And just in case you're curious, here is the same image of NGC 7078. After full calling, keeping only the sharpest images and those images with no satellite trails, and then developed to reveal as many of the stars in the core as possible. I'm just saying, you shouldn't be afraid of calling when you have to do it, because often, less is more. To manually call subs with satellite trails in them, I use a free graphical viewer called EarthenView, which works on about any media file, and it opens FITS files just fine too. And I simply scroll through every image, and any image that presents a satellite trail can be subject to visual calling. And the beauty of EarthenView is it's very fast to open files, even large FITS and TIFF files. And you can just use arrow keys to scroll through the images. Now this process is kind of repetitive and boring, but it also goes pretty quickly. For example, at my latitude, we are right now coming into the deepest part of winter. And for a while, I'll get a good 12 hours per night of nautical darkness. 
since I shoot 60 second subs as a standard. This means that after a good night of imaging, I can end up with as many as 600 subs, and I can review all those subs and call any that are necessary in under 10 minutes using Earthen View. There is another strategy that can help you deal with satellites that, as far as I am concerned, is the best possible strategy. It's a win-win strategy in every possible way. And it is, use the shortest possible exposure times. I mentioned earlier that I lose about 3-5% to of my subs due to satellites. Now these days, almost always for imaging DSOs, I shoot 60 second subs. On average, my system manages to produce about 50 subs per hour. With the remaining time used up in such maintenance processes as dithering, making sure the telescope is centered on target, and checking focus. Let's say I shoot for a 10 hour night just to keep the math simple. That means in a single winter night I'll produce 500 subs. Because the subs are relatively short at 60 seconds, there isn't much chance for satellites to trace across them. An average of about 4%. This means I lose to satellites about 2.4 subs per hour, or at the end of a 10 hour night of shooting, 24 subs, representing about 24 minutes of information. A loss, but not an overly painful loss. Now, in my old days of astrophotography, I used to shoot five minute subs. That was a pretty standard approach for me. And if there was a 4% chance of a satellite tracing across my image shooting a one minute sub, then for a five minute sub, there would be five repetitions of 4% chances. In other words, the chances are still 4% per minute of exposure. But a five minute sub has five 4% chances of a satellite turning up in it. And if that happens, that entire five minutes of integration is lost. With shooting 60 second subs, if I lost 24 subs through the night, that means only a loss of 24 minutes worth of integration. On the other hand, when I was shooting 5 minute subs, if I lost 24 of those subs through the night, that represents the loss of 120 minutes worth of integration. And that much stings. The simple fact is, if you shoot shorter subs and then you need to call one due to a satellite trail, you lose less integration time. And dropping 60 seconds worth of sub versus 5 minutes just doesn't hurt as much. Now I mentioned that shooting shorter subs was a win-win scenario, because it doesn't just help there. You see, integration is integration. It doesn't much matter whether you shoot 1,000 1-minute subs or 100 10-minute subs. Integration is integration. The photons are captured, and their signal is added to the total image when you stack all the information together. But shooting shorter subs also places less demands on your guiding. For example, even though I'm often shooting between 1200 and 2100 millimeters focal length, I'm happy if my guiding is as high as 1.5, it's usually around 0.6 or 7, but even if it's at 1.5, the image is going to come out fine. Shooting shorter subs will also allow for images that have a greater tolerance for widely different ranges of light. For example, if you're shooting a nebula that has very bright regions in it, short subs will avoid blowing out the light within that region. The energy from the darker regions of the nebula will just continue to add up and add up, but with a short exposure, the bright regions of the DSO will not have enough time to pack photons into your sensor's photosites, so they will not become blown out. So shorter subs make you more likely to avoid satellites, make guiding much less demanding on your equipment, and allow you to catch a wider range of light within your image. It's pretty much a win-win. I guess there is one small price if it bothers you. You'll end up with a lot more subs in the morning, so stacking will take longer. For me, I don't worry about it. I have several computers, and the one on which I do astrophotography, I'll just put the information on there and let it stack for 4 hours, 6 hours, 8, 10, 12 hours, whatever. And I'll just use another computer while the computer processing the astrophotography information does its thing. There is one last strategy that you can use as a defense against satellites I, I had mentioned a few minutes ago, and that's to use high focal length telescopes. Okay, I know a viewer told me recently that I'm always preaching the gospel of high focal length telescopes. I keep going on and on about their benefits, and here I go again, it's true. But high focal length telescopes see smaller and smaller regions of the sky. And the smaller the region that you're looking at, the less likely it is that a satellite is going to trace through there. For example, if you were using a very low focal length telescope, I, I don't know, a red cat, for example, with a couple hundred millimeters of focal length, that's going to give a huge field of view, lots of room for satellites to trace through. On the other hand, if you're using an SCT, say a 203 millimeter like I use with a reducer on there, so you're shooting at 1280 millimeters of focal length, depending on your camera sensor, that's going to give you a field of view anywhere from one to twice the width of the full moon. I'm using a Player One Ares M, which has the Sony IMX 533 sensor, 
and it's just big enough to capture the entire full moon at 1280 millimeters of focal length. So the higher focal length offers a smaller field of view in which satellites have a lower percentage chance of being able to appear. So, apart from a software solution, such as one of the new applications that can identify and digitally remove satellite trails, or perhaps just automatically remove ruined subs, or using another digital editing tool such as the in-painting brush with an Affinity Photo, or using my own, perhaps somewhat radical solution of manually inspecting all the subs and calling any with a satellite trail in it, your other reasonable defenses against satellites are to shoot shorter subs and to use higher focal length telescopes. I guess it could take the even more radical step of moving to the Antarctic or buying yourself a barge and floating around on the Arctic Ocean, if you are that inclined. But otherwise, those are your best defenses. I hope that helps, but the truth is, satellite pollution represents an even more vexing problem than light pollution. People can at least use narrowband filters to deal with light pollution, by and large. Narrowband is not a perfect solution, it takes more shooting time, and less information is captured. But still, it's a good solution. But filters won't cut out satellites, unfortunately. And all we can do is adapt to their presence. Thank you for watching, and if you have any thoughts or observations, please leave them in the comment section below. We have a beautiful night coming tonight here at our backwards homestead in the Canadian Highlands, but unfortunately, there's a full moon for more than half the night. Still, I plan to continue shooting one of my targets, IC405, and I'll just use strategic frequency acquisition to gather the information. And I haven't looked to see where it's going to be yet, but if later on the Crab Nebula happens to be where I want it to be, that's the next project that I want to start on. I hope you're having fun too and getting to take some great images. Now get out there and shoot the sky.